This week, we're continuing The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski, otherwise known as General Trajan is the Kool-Aid Man. Oh, yeah. Hi, readers. I'm Jordan. And I'm Katie. And welcome to Not Another Heroine Season 2, the podcast where we break down the best and worst fictional heroines of any genre. (laughs) Because that's what we do now. Want to see what's next on our TBR list? Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Instagram for a sneak peek at upcoming content or to help us pick our next book. This is uh, part two of a thousand. For the Winners <laughs> yeah. Curse trilogy. It's just like slash a little question mark. Like we'll see how many it ends up being. Exactly. <laughs> we'll do a quick kind of recap of what happened previously because mm-hmm. we did kind of skip over a few things mm-hmm. um, that mm-hmm. are because there's so many little things that are important. Yeah, because they you keep them in your pocket and mm-hmm. they come back later. So there's a love child. Uh, the senator, uh, his wife uh, had a baby. I'm. This is difficult. <laughs> the wife, the senator's wife had a baby with this guy named Irex, who's a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Kestrel bought a slave at the slave market. His name is Aaron. He's a blacksmith, but also a singer. And there are some somewhat sketchy circumstances around his purchase. Jess is Kestrel's best friend. Uh, Ronan is Jess's brother. And he has a thing for Kestrel. Mm-hmm. And Kestrel doesn't want to join the military and she doesn't want to get married. And so she doesn't know what to do. And then finally, what we kind of left off is there is this rumor going around Mm -hmm. that a senator, I don't think it's Lady Ferris's husband, it's a different senator, who was arrested because he was caught selling black powder to like another colony. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the, like Eastern savages or something. Yeah. It's a big no, no. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone's in a tizzy about it. Yep. And Kestrel's like, that seems kind of weird. Like. Why would this senator who has done like who is kind of too cowardly to do something Mm -hmm. that overt actually sell black powder? And so she's kind of thinking on this whole situation like there's something else going on. And there sure is. (laughs) Yep. Oh, my God. (laughs) And then there's the whole thing about the captain of the city guard. Oh, yeah. Because he committed suicide. Yeah. Honor suicide is definitely a thing in this Valorian society. Mm-hmm. And like you fall on your sword. Mm-hmm. And I forget why they there was some room, another rumor going around that like he was having like marital troubles or something. Some kind of something. But Kestrel again was like, that's weird. This, like he didn't seem upset when we saw him, you know, a couple yeah, weeks ago. This highly respected captain who's never messed up a day in his life suddenly mm-hmm. commits an honor suicide. And so like mm-hmm. there's something going on. And then also what we didn't really touch on is that Aaron, who kind of gets this limited freedom from Kestrel due to their bargain on the spite and sting gang. He goes out into the city and he meets with Cheat, mm-hmm. who is the auctioneer who sold him off to Kestrel. And we kind of come to discover that Cheat is having Aaron do some things and Aaron is helping out and making some things for something else. Mm-hmm. And that is a very vague way to put it. But <laughs> you eventually figure out that uh, things are not what they seem. No, they are not. <laughs> I think one of the next scenes that happens is her father general trajan comes back from wherever he was fighting and so he's kind of now on the stage of this you know play basically and castro basically makes a deal with him too that she is putting off her decision because at 20 years old she has to decide if she's going to get married or if she's going to join the military and so she's kind of like been kicking the can down the road but her father wants her to make a decision obviously to join the military but she kind of makes this deal of i will no longer have to go to these stupid you know fighting lessons i've never been good at it and in exchange i will make a decision in six months of whether i'm going to join the military or get married But also, you can teach me strategy instead. And so they have these cute little father-daughter teaching moments. It's so good. (laughs) And it's also a good way for the author to talk little tidbits about the history of, you know, kind of create the setting a little bit of like, hey, these are how these nations won and how Valorian got big. And like, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, hold on to that for later. (laughs) And it so closely mirrors the whole like uh, Roman um, Mm -hmm. conquering of, you know, Greece because they talk about how the Herani were these very sophisticated, highly intelligent, like respected the arts. Mm -hmm. And like they stopped caring about defending themselves and about war. They were just focused on all these like higher level Mm -hmm. thinking things. And so that's how the Valorians won is like they were just smarter at fighting. Yeah. Like better strategists, knew how to conquer and like there wasn't even really much of a fight, it seemed like. Yeah, because they... I, I think they said that General Trajan's like, big thing was that the Herons had a good navy and they were well-developed, th- or 
defended that way, but they were on a peninsula and there's this big mountain pass that keeps them safe. And so they thought they were safe. And then General Trajan just blew a hole through the mountain pass. Oh, that was so fucking cool. Okay, so if you okay, if you are a day hard like 1999 Mulan fan, oh, you yeah. will picture this, right? So they always the Heron the Herons Herani ex- always, like you said, expected them to come around from the sea mm-hmm. to invade because that's really the only way because you cannot move a battalion the way that the size of these Valorian battalions are. And so General Trajan, who's like a total badass, he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna make my own way. And like they have black powder cannons. They don't have mm-hmm. guns, but the technology is limited. They fucking blow up the mountain, make their own pass, and march an entire army. And like there's no fight. Nope. They capture the royal family, kill everyone. Yep. And they Kool-Aid man. <laughs> <laughs> you can just picture General Trajan just like, what you I'm here. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So in the course of these like lessons, Kestrel, before she kind of quits her like fighting lessons, there's one scene where she's doing a she's fighting with needles. Oh, yeah. Which is so cool because there's all of these weapons she can fight with. And the only thing she's really good at is needles, which are tiny little daggers. You need to go see the new Deadpool. Oh, really? There's a scene where, like, in one of the first fights with between Deadpool and Wolverine, he pulls out a little knife and he, and he stabs Wolverine with it. He's like, baby knife. And that is, that is Kestrel with these fucking needles. Honestly. Baby knife. <laughs> baby knife. <laughs> I that's kind of Kestrel's like vibe though. Mm-hmm. Like not not a sword, not anything, and just baby knife. <laughs> yep. <sighs> Which will also come back later. Honestly. Um, so other than these lessons, you know, Kestrel and Aaron also have these back and forth where they're still playing bite and sting. And I love like they kind of go a little while without playing, and then she goes into her music room where they've been playing, and she just sees like a single tile on the uh-huh. the table that they play on, and she it like it's his calling card. But they basically are like continually upping the ante almost. And one of the times we find out kind of why Kestrel's mother died. And this is kind of like traumatizing. Ugh. Um, so basically, uh, the Harani, you know, like Jordan said, are super developed. Like they know a lot about the sciences and arts. And there was this plague that swept through the colony. And so the Haranis were the only one that knew how to save people from the plague. And Aaron kind of sees this cut on Kestrel's arm. And he's like, oh, you got the plague. Because the Harani would like cut and kind of drain out the bad blood. And that's how you are saved or whatever. But it's a special cut. And they, you know, the general dragged this doctor in, uh, this Harani doctor, because his wife and his daughter were sick. The doctor cured. Kestrel, but then he kills himself before he can save the wife. And so General Trajan tries to make the same cut. The wife bleeds out and dies. So it's like General Trajan kind of probably had some emotional baggage going on. Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And so Kestrel kind of reveals this to Aaron, which I feel like is a very like intimate bonding moment. Mm. Um, and they also talk about why Aaron has so much like knowledge of the architecture of these Hirani like houses and Kestrel kind of kind of understands that he's maybe an aristocrat. Um, they continually up the bounty or ante and then in another round he asks Kestrel why she isn't already a soldier and she's like I'm not very good at fighting but I also don't want to get married so like I don't know what I'm gonna do. And then Kestrel asks him why he's going or why he was chosen to be a blacksmith. And it's funny because we get his response is that his previous owner thought that he wasn't the type to raise his hand in anger. And then we immediately in the next scene get him and she talking about some sus stuff. So much so. They're staging a rebellion, he, basically. Yeah. Aaron is making weapons but- and giving them to cheat. He's gross. He's slimy. Like- he's slimy and gross, but you have to. This is where the author does things really, really well, because she has these very robust secondary characters mm-hmm. who they they fulfill their purpose. They do their role. And you understand that they have to be that way to achieve what they have, because, Ar- frankly, Aaron could not have led a revolution. No. He's too um, emotional mm-hmm. and he's swayed too easily, yeah. I think, which is why he's so influenced by Cheat. And Cheat is very kind of ruthless and cold blooded. Yeah. And you are, he's enslaved. He watched his whole country fall. He is going to wreak total havoc on the Valorians if he can. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get revenge. Yeah. Like he 100 percent is like, I'm going to kill all these people. I don't care. And is that. I mean, is that wrong? Like an eye for an eye kind of thing? Like, it's yeah. kind of hard to see, but it's not a black and white thing. And that's what the author does really well is just she broaches these very 
tough subjects and it kind of puts it on this on the fence like well you can't you can't look at this as a black and white situation like people are individuals and they're going to react differently and all of that. it's just so good mm-hmm. <sighs> but the last line she is kind of concerned about like kestrel and her being the general's daughter and like what kind of knowledge does she have and you can tell that aaron has this moment of like oh shit and then he's like kestrel is not going to be an issue like her fighting skills were exaggerated but you feel this kind of inner turmoil of like he's betraying her trust a little bit and you can tell he doesn't feel good about it but it's just this one like the throwaway line but you're like you feel the like struggle a little bit you feel the like already the investment that they yeah. have in each other without even knowing it themselves uh-huh. Ooh, <sighs> um one of the next bite and sting games aaron asked kestrel to play the piano for him <sighs> and it's this like harani song and we learn later that Aaron's mother used to sing it when she had guests over. So like uh, emotional. And then we also find out that Aaron is actually a singer and they have this cute thing where she's like playing the piano and she's like, are you a singer? And he's like, no. And then she kind of like goes lower down on the register because she's like, oh, he's like a little bit like a deeper tone. And he's like, stop, Kestrel. And then he walks out and it's like, just fuck already. God, (laughs) so so fucking good. (sighs) Well, later on, there's Mm -hmm. this uh, spring summer party thing. And Jess, uh, Jess is... Kestrel's very close girlfriend. Mm. And Jess, I don't think, gets the, like, attention she deserves. Mm -hmm. She's kind of written off as, like, oh, she's the best friend. Like, she's there to help her get dressed and go to these parties and things. But there's so much more to Jess as you learn throughout these books. And so Jess is very adamant about, like, all right, Kestrel, you're a little awkward. You don't have any, like, (laughs) sense of fashion. Let me dress you. Let me pick out your dress for this this ball that's upcoming. And so Kestrel's like, oh, whatever. Like, (laughs) I love you. Cool. You can can do the dress thing. It's fine. (laughs) And they get ready. They get this dress. And Kestrel goes to this ball where all of like the the aristocrats, all of the senators are going to this party. She brings Aaron along as her escort. It's so cool because Kestrel is just kind of oblivious to the optics. Mm-hmm. She's just yeah. like, this is my friend. This is my escort. She doesn't see anything wrong with it. She just doesn't think that way. But everybody else is thinking something else. Uh, Your dirty secret lover. Uh, yeah, because Aaron is very handsome. Mm-hmm. He's he's described as like black hair and gray eyes because like, come on, obviously, and yeah. that's the description of all of them. Every, yeah, <laughs> and they go to this party, and Kestrel dismisses Aaron to like the kitchens or something, or mm-hmm. she's forced to. Mm-hmm. And Aaron is already acting very weird when they arrive. It's like there's something wrong. Like he recognizes this house that that, that this party is being held at, and it's. Irex. Irex? Yeah, his party. Yeah, and it's at the governor's mansion. Or not the governor's mansion. I think it's at his house because that's that's a later ball. Yeah. Like, this basically is all just like balls and parties. Yeah. But this is Irex's house. And Irex is, like, he is angry at Kestrel. And so, like, when she goes through, like, the receiving line and shakes his hand, Irex is like, oh, fuck you up. <laughs> like, <laughs> Why did you show up at my party? You weren't invited. <laughs> it, yeah. So, Aaron gets dismissed. Kestrel goes to, like, the ballroom and she's hanging out. And then there's a bit of a commotion. Uh oh. Aaron has been pulled aside and Irex is pissed off and he's like, Your slave stole something from me. Castro <laughs> <laughs> gets escorted into the library where all these senators are standing around. Irex is like pissed off and Aaron is has this guilty look on his face. And Kestrel was like wanting to believe that like Aaron was framed or something, but no, like Aaron straight up did a dumb move Mm -hmm. and he was in a library and he was holding a book Mm -hmm. and it's Erex's book because Erex's house now. Kestrel tries to play it off. She does a very good job at managing the situation and trying to be like, it's just a book, Erex. Like, uh, what the fuck? Why do you care? Are you so poor that like a single book? Like, really? Yeah. (laughs) And like, she almost pulls it off but not really. And Mm -hmm. she goes and takes the book and and opens it. And then she realizes that there is a dedication, like a handwritten dedication on the inside of the book. Yeah. And it says to Aaron from X and Y. And it's to Aaron from his parents. And Kestrel's like, oh, shit, this was Aaron's house. He lived here. Like, this is his stuff. And Aaron, like, as he's being held back by the senators, he's, like, yelling at Kestrel, don't open that book. Don't fucking read that book. And, like, she opens it, looks at him, and, like, all of the pieces fall together. And Aaron kind of, like, slumps, like, fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I feel emotional just, like, thinking about this because you have the gift of the knowledge of, like, where the relationship is later. But it's, like, the turmoil of all of these fucking scenes. Ah, Can you imagine, like... 
Aaron's pride and like mm-hmm. this was his house. His whole family was murdered. He's brought back and he's now in his own home as a slave. Yeah. He's being accused of the like, like, yeah, it's like it's yours. Yeah. But, and, Not. No. And Eric's refuses to be like. Yeah. He demands Aaron's flogged. And Aaron is like, fine, whatever. Like, I'll fucking do it. And Kestrel's like, no, like you can't damage my property. And Aaron's like, Kestrel, what the fuck are you doing like i've been flogged before like it's fine like back down and then kestra like purposely miss like construes what iric said and basically like challenges him to a duel to a duel this small little valorian woman is like i'm smart but i'm not a great fighter i'm going to duel you over this man like i love the like reverse uh because it's always the guy like dueling over you know something to a woman's honor and she's like no this is this is my guy uh we're gonna fucking fight about it oh my god (laughs) (sighs) and eric's is like challenge accepted bitch yep okay well (laughs) here's your uh death price yeah so they go home and aaron is fucking furious he's like what you're gonna die like withdraw from this duel and she's like if lauren honors her fucking word like i'm not withdrawing from anything yeah because don't they have oh yeah so they're in the carriage together or whatever and they're fighting and he's upset and she comes out with this line again you might not think of me as your friend but i think of you as mine oh my god (laughs) God. oh yeah and that is so that is such kestrel because the only like there's no romantic inclinations going on in kestrel's mind Mm -hmm. she's just she enjoys playing bite and sting with this man because again uh what we hadn't touched on before is that one she was raised by a harani woman Mm -hmm. um who she later purchased like she bought this woman's freedom bought her a cottage and is taking care of her for the rest of her life this is this is an i Mm -hmm. yeah kestrel's brain does not compartmentalize people and slavery and she's just does not know how to handle people because she grew up in hair and she mm-hmm. looks at these people as like her family and her friends and yeah. so she's struggling with how to categorize and treat Aaron and that whole line with I you are my friend and I will protect you as my friend and I love it too because this is also within the context that um, kind of around this time in the story and I passes away and she was really adamant that Kestrel not get her a doctor she's like I'm fine I'm just an old lady but then she dies and we kind of get the scene where Kestrel's in mourning and it's like obviously raining outside because you know the vibes and Aaron is pissed off he's like you don't get to grieve like this woman she was your slave like you have enslaved her whole people like she only loved you because you killed her whole family and like Kestrel's really upset and like Aaron is just mad but then he turns around and he's like I'm sorry like she loved you like she had a little like braid of your baby hair in her room or whatever but it's like this like kind of duality or do what is that duality duality there we go maybe maybe I don't know I'm not (laughs) certain about that one but it's like you can be friends but it's also still existing within this context of like slave and master is friendship even possible yeah oh god oh so deep for just <laughs> yeah a ya Come fantasy a YA fantasy yeah <laughs> no it's not uh-uh. <laughs> bitch <sighs> okay <sighs> so they return home and like the next day a delivery is made to kestrel's home and it's erex delivering like 500 gold pieces or something and that is the death price because it is illegal to duel in the empire and if you get caught dueling you have to pay a tax which Mm -hmm. is like the death price and you're compensating the family for the death of their loved one because everyone knows kestrel's gonna die that's such a fucking raw move to like i already know you're gonna die here's the money like bro kestrel like rightfully is super nervous she's like uh, I, I don't know what to do. This is, I'm going to get fucked up. Like she is she is very nervous and she's trying to think of ways like how do I handle this situation? And so she writes two letters. She writes a letter to her father and then she writes a letter to um, Jess and Ronan. Jess and Ronan. But as she's walking out to have these letters delivered, uh, she runs into Aaron and Aaron is like, you aren't doing this. Like, <laughs> I will go get flogged. It will be fine. And you are going to stay here. And he, like, very much tries to be, like, the like man in charge Macho. and, like, tell her, like, <laughs> this is not happening. And Kestrel's like, oh, no, no, I'm I'm fine. Like, I'm withdrawing from the duel. See this? This is a letter to my father. And, like, she lets him, like, think, skim it or something. And this is a letter to Jessen or a letter to Erex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She says, I'm withdrawing from the duel. This is the letter. I'm going to go deliver it. And you, you're welcome to come with me if you'd like to. And so <laughs> he's like... This is <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So he follows her out. And as she's walking toward like the stables or something, she tells the guards, seize that slave and, and throw him in like, like, make sure, he, make sure he doesn't leave. And all the pieces fall into place. And Aaron's like, 
Because in the same breath, she's like, give this to my father and give this to Justin Ronan and then enslave or like lock up that slave. And he's like, she duped me. <laughs> it was such a power move for Kestrel. Oh, yeah. That was like the best heroine move in this book. Like she's like she she had the chess game laid out like five moves in advance. Yeah. And then had the balls to just like do it. Unemotional, like lock that slave up. <laughs> oh, my God. Go Kestrel. And then she goes go to Kestrel. Go Kestrel. <laughs> anyway, sorry. No, no, I was jamming. That was good. Uh, so she goes to the fight. She mm-hmm. goes to the duel. And her father's there. Because ah! <laughs> I think she's nervous, too, that he's not going to show up. Because he probably is like, what the fuck are you doing, Kestrel? But then he, like, shows up at the last second. And he, she's like, make sure you, like, stand at the front. And he's like, I wouldn't be anywhere else. And it's like, oh, no. <laughs> Daddy <What>? Trajan. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, and then... Eryx gave her, like, the option to choose the weapons they were going to fight with. And she chose to fight with needles because it's the only thing she's really good at. And she chose needles for another reason, which was mm-hmm. phenomenal. So as they're fighting, she's getting the shit beat out of her. Yes. Like, he kicks her knee in. Yeah, it's, like, fucked up. Yeah, it's very kind of graphic. Mm-hmm. But she gets close enough where she's able to, like, talk to him. Like, she was, like, I think she disarms him once or something. Mm-hmm. And she's like, hmm. So Lady Ferris, you know, her her baby uh, looks a lot like you, bitch. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> and no. basically she blackmails Erex because he's got like political goals of his own. Yeah. And if the senator, Lady Ferris's husband, finds out that uh, he is banging his wife, his political goals are not going to happen. He's going to get blackballed. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so good. And so Kestrel basically negotiates for him to like, not only is he not going to kill her, but He's going to make it look like she won the fight oh. on her own. Because <laughs> the last line is something like that. Like, oh, yeah, and you're going to throw this fight and make it convincing my father's here. It's like, God damn, Kestrel, what the fuck? It's hot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and so she is pretty beat up and her mm-hmm. knee is jacked, uh, but she wins. I love the next scene where uh, her father's like helping her and she tries to get on the horse and it's like kind of a hot mess. And he's like, we can bring the carriage. And she's like, no, I'm going to ride this horse and like walk away. And you can tell that Daddy Trajan is like, my little pumpkin pie is growing <laughs> up. <laughs> I love that you're calling him Daddy Trajan. I, honestly, he is. He has daddy energy. <laughs> yeah. Except, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. everybody has, you know, mistakes. <laughs> um, <sighs> so... She go. She makes it back to their estate, and the, the doctor is summoned, and her knee is ah oh, this scene. So, Daddy Trajan is like, "All right, my dear. Um, I've seen this injury. You're gonna be fine. We just need to pop the knee back into place, and it will heal very quickly." I thought this was so amazing. Where he's like, "I can fix it for you if you trust me to fix it, but I understand why you wouldn't if you want to wait for the doctor." And Kestro, because like they're both in that moment, they're not articulating it, but they're both remembering her mom and how he basically killed her. Um, and Kestro is like, "No, Dad, fix it for me." I. Uh, it's crazy. The skill required to not only have this back knowledge just kind of like tossed out there in a different context, but then to bring it back, but not draw like total attention to it for this kind of like one line interaction that like doesn't really like push forward the plot really, but has so much fucking like punching power. <sighs> I'm not OK. I- <laughs> Yeah. So he fixes her knee and she starts recovering, but she's recovering and Aaron is nowhere nowhere to be found. Um, And that is because Daddy Trajan goes to have a little conversation with Aaron. This is so hot, weirdly. I, I know. It was kind of strange. Like, what? I like, I'm turned on by both of them. Ooh. Oh my God. Uh, anyways, yeah, he shows up and he's basically, I will kill you. Don't talk to Kestrel again. If you stir up more gossip, you're gone. I will sell you once things die down. And this is not a discussion. Like, this you're going to leave. End of it. Yeah. <laughs> because, so what is becoming more and more overt now is that these rumors that, you know, Aaron and Kestrel are like, lovers mm-hmm. and like kestrel's like excuse me I'm like what <laughs> i'm just an awkward lady hanging out with my friend and everybody's yeah. like mm, girl. No. and she gets a letter from like an anonymous court lady who's yeah. like you're fucking it up for the rest of us like you can totally have a relationship with your slave you just got to be quiet about it like and not take him everywhere you go yeah and they call her like a whore and like yeah it's really horrible sh- it's really shady but <sighs> Yeah, uh, Daddy Trajan definitely lays the law down, and he can lay down the law anytime he wants. Oh, my God. <laughs> but also true. <laughs> I am here for it. 
<laughs> and Aaron is like, well, she got into a duel for me and I kind of agree. So he keeps his distance and he mm-hmm. does not um, go and find her. And meanwhile, Kestrel's like doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know. She doesn't know that this conversation happened. She's like, why hasn't Aaron come to check on me? I fought this duel for him. And like, yeah, because doesn't she go and like talk to him? And she's like, why haven't you come to see me? And he's like, I don't want to see you. Some kind of something. But it's just this like Kestrel's just looking for a friend and she doesn't really understand. And she's like, I don't care what society says. And he's like. Well, you kind of need to grow a little bit. Oh. oh, my heart hurts for little Kestrel. There's another kind of ball in the works, and it's like the midwinter's ball mm-hmm. or something. It's like a turning point in the season. It's the big to do. It's at the governor's mansion. Everybody who's anybody is going to be there. It's a big deal. Mm hmm. But the general kind of uh, in a little tidbit sidebar to Kestrel says that he has to leave the morning of the ball because the emperor has said that he has to take the whole regiment to go fight the eastern savages. And Kestrel's like, wait, but the city is going to be unprotected. And the general's like, "Ah, the city guard's going to be here. It's going to be fine. The city guard's going to be here. But also my friend, the sailor and captain is going to bring his fleet in. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be fine. (laughs) Because it's been it's been 10 years since they conquered Heron. So they're kind of a little bit more relaxed relaxed about the colony now uh they shouldn't be um but yeah that's kind of where they're at so they're getting ready for this ball and that's kind of it I, yeah um uh because i forgot but when kestrel goes to like confront Aaron of like why haven't you come to see me like i thought we were friends basically says we're not friends you own me like we could never be friends mm. and so they're kind of at odds but then we immediately get the scene where Aaron goes to cheat to kind of like hear this news because Kestrel's like my dad's gonna be gone like it doesn't even matter we can go back to how everything was like we don't need to freak out and then Aaron immediately tells cheat that the general's gonna be gone with his entire regiment and cheat is like well we're going to have the rebellion that night easy peasy and we're going to poison the wine I have a surprise <laughs> exactly and and meanwhile, all of the rumors about Kestrel and Aaron are still going around. And Kestrel's being kind of shunned by society mm-hmm. and looked down upon. Uh, Jess and Ronan do not. Like, they they stand by her, which I thought is super nice. <laughs> and in the midst of this, Ronan proposes marriage to Kestrel. Ugh, this scene so it hurts. <laughs> and doesn't he propose at the ball? Um, I think they're like riding together and he's like, you should still go anyway. You know, we'll protect you with our reputations. Like you should just go and say fuck it to them. But you should marry me, Kestrel. Kestrel's like, oh, I don't know. And he kind of like accuses her. He's like, why wouldn't you marry me? And she's like, well, like, what are your reasons for marriage? And he kind of lists off some very kind of like plain things. And she's like, but you don't like love me. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, that doesn't really matter. Is there someone else? And Kestrel kind of like fumbles the ball. She's like, no, not really. And he's like, there is. There is. <laughs> Ronan's not an idiot. <sighs> um, so Kestrel's kind of on the fence about going to the ball, but she up until like the very last day and she kind of resolves to to go like so her dad leaves they have before her dad leaves the colony they have this very significant dinner oh yeah the with, captain with the captain so the captain i forget his name he is like a very well known naval officer and he he's kind of like a merchant now but back in the day he was like a badass navy captain <laughs> and, and retired <laughs> yeah and he's been around for several years of like kestel's childhood mm-hmm. and so they're having dinner and they're having dinner on these very specific china with bird patterns on it mm-hmm. and kestel's like that's an interesting choice and she recognizes that her dad and the captain have more going on as like a security backup plan than anyone's letting on. And she suspects that they're going to be using the names of eagles and hawks and, I don't know, my brain. (laughs) Other birds. Other birds. Miscellaneous birds. As a code, because when ships are docked in harbor to prevent people taking over the ships, like by rowing up to them, being like, hey, I'm your friend, let's let me up. There has to be like a code exchange, uh, which I thought was very smart. Mm -hmm. And so Kestrel thinks she knows what the code is. uh, So she kind of tucks that in the back of her brain to be used later, Mm -hmm. uh, which Mm -hmm. is significant. Put it in your pocket. (laughs) And so everybody leaves. She's kind of dwelling on this dinner and she's like, she tells Aaron, you know what? I'm going to go to this ball. Fuck those people. Like, Mm -hmm. nothing bothers me. 
Uh, and then we get this scene that she's getting ready for the ball. Her maid is like off somewhere else because, you know, they assume that she wasn't going to go and she's trying to struggle to do her hair. Her and Aaron haven't talked in a while and Aaron shows up and he offers to help her do her hair. And- ah! There's so much intimacy with just him braiding her hair. Yeah. And she's like, how do you know how to do this? Because he does some very intricate braids. And he's like, well, I used to do this for my for my older sister. Yeah. You can tell Kestrel's having a moment, too. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, later she's, like, all the, like, subtle touches of, like, my neck. And, like, you can tell it was one of those, like, coming to Jesus can moments you, for her. <laughs> can you imagine this, like, this scene in a like in a show or oh. a movie like it would be so well done oh yeah it'd have the like uh close-up of the hands and you'd get some like soft piano music in the background mm-hmm. and you get the weird like sheer curtain cut scenes like it yeah they would have went all over <laughs> well and then Aaron insists on going with her to the ball mm-hmm. like yeah I yeah because he knows what's gonna happen ah yeah and he's like I, I read this book I swear <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's it's fucking wild because he he knows what's going to happen and he is almost in a panic over her going to going mm. there. So they get in the carriage, they go to the ball, and as soon as they arrive, he's like, don't drink the wine. Yeah. And he's like angry about it too. And Kesha's like, what the fuck? Like, And she okay. doesn't put anything together. She's like, okay, I won't touch the wine. And then he goes to the kitchens and he's like, has the apple wine been served yet? So it's this very special like toasting wine mm-hmm. that they like imported from somewhere. And that's the wine that's been poisoned. Oh, maybe Ronan does ask her I think for it's, marriage at the ball. Yeah. So yeah. she's kind of being shunned by everyone at the ball. She's kind of standing on the sidelines like, no one's talking to me. This is kind of awkward. And then Ronan arrives and asks her to dance. Yeah. And so she's dancing yeah. with him. And, and he's like, come on. Come on, Kestrel. Like, let's get married. Like, I've known you for years. Like, Ronan is clearly in love with Kestrel. Yeah. Like, there is a lot more emotion on his side than on hers. Um, and he asks her. And when he asks her, she says no. But then she looks across the ballroom and oh, she yeah. looks and sees Aaron standing there. And then Ronan follows her eyes and sees Aaron, looks back at her. And, like, you can that's oh. feel the rage. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? And, like, he, like, stalks off. And then she leaves crying. I forgot about this. God. Ah! She leaves Bo crying. They get in the carriage together. Aaron is obviously like relieved because I think they have this moment where he kind of like sighs and like looks relieved. And Kestrel's like, what the fuck is that about? But then she kind of, you know, leaves it for now. And basically he's like, Kestrel, like, why are you crying? And Kestrel's like, no, I can't see anything. And she's like, Ronan asked me to marry him. And he's like, well, why can't you marry him? And Kestrel's like, because of you. And she's like, she looks at him with her heart in her eyes. And like Aaron's like, it's like everything falls into place for him. And like he leans forward and like. I don't even know. I don't even really want to like articulate what happens in the character. It feels kind of sacred. Yeah. Oh, God. But of course, um, because, you know, there's plot that's happening behind this an explosion goes off just know just know that the entire this entire book up until this point is building up into this very short scene in the carriage and it will haunt you the rest of the book (laughs) does i feel like a lot of this is like missed timing almost like right people wrong time or whatever because they have this very intimate moment and then an explosion goes off and Kestrel's like, what was that? And Aaron's like, black powder kegs. And then there's more explosions. And then she's like, why did you know the answer to that? <sighs> and then we get this scene. The explosion goes off and something happens with the carriage and Kestrel, you know, rips out of it and tries to grab um, a horse. And she's like, give me a fucking horse. I'm like getting out of here. Like, what's going on? And the driver does something and Kestrel basically like takes him as like a captive. She has a knife to his throat and Aaron's like, calm down. Like, you know, what are you going to do? And then we get this dialogue. What would your next move be after killing your driver? Will you attack me? Will you succeed? Kestrel says, I'll kill myself. Aaron took a step back. You wouldn't, yet there was a fear in his eyes. In honor suicide, all Valorian children are taught how, when we come of age, my father showed me where to stab. No, you wouldn't. You play a game to its end. The Harani were enslaved because they were too poor at killing and too cowardly to die. I told you I didn't want to kill, not that I wouldn't, and I never said I was afraid of death. Aaron looked at the driver, unhitched both of the horses. Oh my <gasps> god. Kestrel, this is the most Kestrel. <laughs> 
as a power move, like, this is the difference between Kestrel and Aaron. Yeah. Kestrel is willing to to be ruthless. Yeah. And to make those hard decisions. Yeah. Aaron cannot. No. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what makes Kestrel so compelling as a character, too, because we always get these kind of, like, sissy ninny characters who are, like, not willing to fucking go cold-blooded. But Kestrel's like, I'm going to fucking kill myself. Like, try me. And as a reader, you don't. You don't really know if Kestrel would do it or not. Yeah. Like, you can almost believe that that she would. God. And I even think that Aaron remarks on it when they're playing games or something that he's like, Kestrel loves gambling and she's so good at it because she she's like can bluff. Mm-hmm. And like, you don't really know if she's bluffing or not. And that's what this is. She could be bluffing, but there's that chance, like that significant chance that she's fucking not. <laughs> it's what Aaron describes is that she has the very fact that she has no tells is what gives her away. Like, he knows there's something brewing. Oh, God. It was just so fucking, like, ugh. reading that line was just... Uh, oh. So she gets on the horse, and she, like, gallops away. She goes to her estate, and as she gets there, she realizes that there's guards lying dead in the courtyard and horses running around, and, like, it's pure chaos. And then she's captured. Yeah. So Cheat, the auctioneer, captures her and throws her down and like she's kind of uh, i don't know bound her hands are bound together she's She's like fighting back yeah and then she kind of like goes to step on her hands yeah she's like lying on the ground and she like is about to crush her fingers because knowing that she's a musician because aaron has told him that she's a musician yeah and then aaron shows up and he tells she uh that kestrel is his war prize and she is his slave and then we get this little Cheat's like, well, if she misbehaves, go for the hands. And Kestrel pieces it together that like Aaron was in on this like the whole time and that like he was talking about her in like, yeah, she's betrayed. And she learns about the poison wine. Oh. And then she panics and she realizes Jess and Ronan were still at the party. And that is the end of part two. <laughs> Hold on to your horses, because that's only 60% of the book. Yep. <laughs> we will wrap The Winter's Curse up, this book one, not the trilogy, <laughs> <laughs> book one uh, in part three. Mm. So from our shelf to yours, we'll see you on the next page. Hi, readers. If you'd like to help us pick our next book, send us a message on Instagram. Or if you'd like to just listen, we post new episodes every Monday and Wednesday on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. Thanks for listening. Bussin'.